Ladies and gentlemen, season three, episode 19 of the Daily Mission podcast. I'm in studio and it is your host, Greg Brown. I hope you all enjoyed your weekends. I hope you all enjoyed the uh, Ross Colton interview. It was really exciting for me to have Ross Colton on. Uh, Tampa Bay Lightning forward, obviously cup winning, cup clinching goal, scored a game winner in his first game. He told some great stories about the party with the cup. So I hope you guys enjoyed Ross Colton. We'll have some 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 more great guests uh, in the near future and uh, we'll keep plugging along. But uh, this is the pregame show, episode 19, season 3, and the FIFA World Cup starts Sunday. So this is a really exciting World Cup. I mean, we've got the States, we've got Mexico, we've got Canada, who will host in 2026, all playing in the 2022 World Cup. I mean, for me, obviously being a Canadian, very exciting for for Canadian fans to be able to watch uh, the soccer team that hasn't been in since 86, I do believe. And in 86, they got absolutely dusted. They got rinsed, and uh, they they didn't even score a goal, so... A little bit more promise this time around with Alfonso Davies, uh, major star in, in Germany, and and um, and Jonathan David, and so there's some stars on Canada, and hopefully they can score a goal. Hopefully they can win. I mean, uh, it seems like they'll be able to take on Morocco, but Croatia and Belgium might be a, a bit of a different story. Uh, but I'm really excited about it. So it opens on Sunday, November 20th, Qatar plays host to, I forget who plays Qatar, but I'm, I'm assuming Qatar gets dusted, so we'll be riding uh, whoever Qatar's playing. But the FIFA World Cup, so we'll cover that on the Daily Intermission. I mean, obviously not usually a soccer channel, soccer podcast, but when the World Cup rolls around every four years, you got to poke your head in, and and uh, and it, it definitely gets my attention. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the FIFA World Cup, and I know all of you guys will be. Continuing on the pregame show, UFC... 281 this weekend in New York, and it was absolutely electric. There were three massive fights. I had Sam Alvey on. I hope you guys checked out the social channels to check out Sam's best bets. They weren't fantastic, but he did call the upset in the main event. So the first big foot of the night was Michael Chandler versus Dustin Poirier, and was this ever a banger? Dustin Poirier continues to look like he's out of the fight. He looks like he's getting pounded. He really looks like he's losing, and he looks like he's going to lose. Michael Chandler came out flying. And then Dustin Poirier, he just finds another gear and he stays in the fight and he ends up knocking out Chandler. Or choking out Chandler, I do apologize. But Chandler was fighting greasy. So Michael Chandler had, you know, he, he had a nose full of blood. He snorted on on Dustin Poirier's face. He was sticking his fingers in his mouth. He was fighting dirty. But, I mean, who can blame him? It's a fight. But that was the first of the big three fights. So Dustin Poirier chuck, ch- chokes out <laughs> Michael uh, Chandler. And then... The women went at it. It was um, Carla Esparza versus Zhang Wiley. And Zhang Wiley gets the belt back. She dominated. I mean, this girl, I don't know how she lost. I mean, she's an absolute monster. So Wiley wins. Uh, Sam Alvey on the predictions thought that Carla would, would be able to wrestle with her, but it was not the case. Wiley wins easily. And then the main event, Israel Adesanya versus Pereira. So these two have a lot of history. So I was watching the road to to, uh, to UFC 281, and these two are historically kickboxers. And Pereira had kickboxed Israel Adesanya twice and had beat him twice. And so he had a 2-0 record coming in against Israel Adesanya. And so there was some beef. There was some history with this fight. It's really exciting. So Pereira's made the shift over to the UFC, and he has been a content machine, knocking guys out with knees, with fists. And uh, it's been, you know, just a tremendous run for for Pereira. And and he ends up knocking out Israel Adesanya in the fifth round. I mean, it seemed like Israel Adesanya had, you know, his grasp on the fight for the first four rounds. But Pereira knocks him out. And Pereira is now the belt holder. And, I mean, I I would like to see a a rematch there. But what, I mean... I love these UFC cards, and, and betting on UFC is, is so tremendous. We In the undercard, we had uh, Molly the Meatball, who's good friends with Patty Pimble. She's got affiliation with Barstool Sports. She got just absolutely dominated. I was on the plus 800 Molly Meatball knockout, but that was just... I, there was a reason it was plus 800. It was an awful bet. Um, but, it, I mean, it, it continues to draw my attention. I'm really enjoying the UFC, and there were some announcements. Dana White had a press conference after the UFC, I'm sorry, a door just shut behind me in another office. Um, but there's going to be some massive fights in the new year. We're looking at John Jones and Francis Naganu. Unbelievable. We're looking at Alexander Volkanovsky is going to move up and fight Islam. Unbelievable. I mean, there's some really exciting fights just around the corner. It looks like Conor McGregor is going to make a return to the UFC. I mean, the UFC continues to be a content machine. And uh, it's just, it's a really exciting sport to watch. And I'm really enjoying it. 
in the golf world, continuing on in the pregame show, Tony Finau wins the Houston Open. This guy's on a bit of a heater. His fifth PGA Tour win. The field wasn't the strongest, but there were some there were some names. Hideki played, Scotty Scheffler played, uh, but Tony Finau. I mean, he ran he ran away with it. There was no real scare. I mean, he won the tournament. It seemed like on Friday. So congratulations to Tony Finau with another big win. Tony, I mean, he always stepped and ran out a few majors. Mark my words. So he's a guy that we'll be laying some money on at the majors. Uh, obviously, I was off of him this week. He missed the cut at the CJ Cup. And I was like, you know what? Like, I don't know if he's playing well or if he's just kind of disinterested because they're about to go on a big break. But, pff, boy, was I wrong. He ends up winning. So Tony Finau wins the Houston Open. And uh, this week with the RM set, uh, RSM Classic, uh, which is in Sea Island, Georgia, a lot of the players reside there. So it's going to be a fun tournament, the last one to bet on. So we'll we'll fire some money around uh, this week, and then we'll get ready for the for the uh, for the January start. Obviously, there's the tournament champions in December, which Tiger is going to be playing. But uh, but we'll wait for January, and I am going to be doing the one and done pool again on Run Your Pool. So uh, look out for updates on the social accounts for that. That's going to be extremely exciting. That's a lot of fun. But uh, just finally in the pregame show, Tiger Woods, Rory McIlroy versus Justin uh, Thomas and Jordan Spieth in the match, December 10th. That's going to be exciting. It's going to be night golf, 12 holes. I'm fired up. Four amazing characters on the PGA Tour. So that's going to be extremely exciting on December 10th for golf fans. Tiger Woods, Roy McIlroy versus Jordan Spieth and Justin Thomas under the lights. So that's December 10th. We'll continue to monitor that. But ladies and gentlemen, it's time for quarter one and we're moving into the NFL. It's week 10 and it's almost finished. We have got the Monday Nighter tonight with Philadelphia and Washington. We'll get into that. But we'll start things off Sunday. I love these early games. I love starting off Sunday with, for me, a 10.30 start for you know anybody in the United States earlier. Um, but they were playing in Germany. Tom Brady took on the Seattle Seahawks, Tampa Bay. And they're starting to look like themselves. Obviously, with the big comeback win last week over the Rams. This week, they took care of Seattle. Seattle, they beat. They were up fourteen, I think, at the half. Seattle came back, had a bit of a you know comeback chance, but the Bucs hold them off, twenty-one to seventeen. A guy on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for all the fantasy owners out there, Rashad White was balling. He ran for over one hundred and fifteen yards. I mean, this kid, rookie out of Arrow, Ohio. Or, a rookie out of Arizona State. He looked fantastic. So if you're a fantasy player in the NFL world, look at this Rashad White guy. See if he's on the waiver wire. I mean, typically he wouldn't be uh, in a lot of deep leagues, but he might be. So take a peek for this guy because it looked like Leonard Fournette was a little bit banged up. But touchdowns from Julio Jones, touchdowns from Chris Godwin, uh, they look good. So the Tampa Bay Buccaneers leading their division. They're getting things back on track, so it's nice to see. So let's go with a little rundown from the afternoon games into the night. The Titans take care of the Broncos. Nothing really riding for, for Russell Wilson and the Denver Broncos right now. They lose 17-10 to 10 to the Titans. Miami absolutely beats the wheels off of Cleveland. Tua? Tua's made a lot of strides. I mean, in his first two seasons, a lot of skepticism around what Tua was bringing to the table. I know Miami fans were a little discouraged with Tua, but he looks fantastic. And the weapons he has are just endless. I mean, we look at the two receivers in Jalen Waddle and Tyree Kill, and these guys are absolutely monsters, man. And Jeff Wilson Jr., who they acquired at the trade line, deadline from San Francisco, fantastic game. So this Miami team, I mean, obviously Bradley Chubb, too, from the Broncos. This Miami team is for real. They're good. Um, and they beat the wheels off of Cleveland. I actually thought Cleveland might keep this close. I thought Jacob Brissett might uh, be able to, you know, I thought they'd be able to establish the run with Nick Chubb and be able to play okay, but they did not. Miami beat the wheels off of them. The Steelers who I was on, end up beating the New Orleans uh, Saints at home. If there's one guy in the NFL that pisses me off, it's Taysom Hill. And not because... He, it, it's due to the fact that he's such a tweener, and the New Orleans Saints try to try to find ways to use him, and I get it. He, you know, he's a decent wildcat quarterback. He can throw a little bit, but he's not a true quarterback. Like He's not good enough to be your everyday starter. He, he's just He annoys me, I should say. Taysom Hill, he, there's nothing more annoying than a guy, especially too if you're a fantasy owner of a New Orleans Saint, like an Alvin Kamara or a receiver, and then you get this guy going in for goal line scores, and it's just a, it's just so annoying. He's got to be the most annoying player in the NFL. That might be a hot take, but he just annoys me. New Orleans looks terrible. Uh, so the Steelers take care of New Orleans at home. Big win for them coming off the bye. Detroit! The Lions, who I was on, if you watched my best bets of the week, the Lions end up beating Chicago at home. Justin Fields, this guy's interesting. I mean, I, I gave him a little shit during my rant for my best bets, but he's coming off a 176 rushing game and a 147 rushing game. But the issue is here is you got to win. 
But Detroit ends up beating Chicago at home. I love it. I, I love Detroit winning two in a row. Dan Campbell staying, staying strong there. I mean, I don't know how much noise Detroit's going to make, but it's nice to see them win some games. And Chicago's an absolute dumpster fire. The game of the week, potentially the game of the year, the Buffalo Bills lose in overtime to the Minnesota Vikings. Now, I was on the Buffalo Bills in a big way. I thought Josh Allen would bounce back after not playing very well against the New York Jets. I thought just the entire team of the Buffalo Bills would bounce back. But boy, was I wrong. They were up 17 points in the third quarter. I'm walking around with my balls in a wheelbarrow saying, I knew the Buffalo Bills were going to take care of the Vikings. But the Vikings end up coming back. Justin Jefferson, best receiver in the league. I don't care. I don't care what anybody has to say. This guy is unfucking believable he is making catches that nobody else in the league makes. He gets open. It can be a contested catch. Toes in. I mean, this guy does it all. He's such a great route runner. His hands are phenomenal. This guy is the best receiver. He is the cream of the crop. I don't care what anybody says about DeAndre Hawkins, about Cooper Cup. It's Justin Jefferson. And I called that at the beginning of the season. I won't pump my tires too much. But Justin Jefferson makes an unbelievable catch. Josh Allen drives the field in overtime. So Minnesota gets the ball. They go and score a field goal. So they've got an opportunity, the Bills, to go down and score, win the game. And Justin and um, Josh Allen, he throws a pick. Brutal. You hate to see it. There's a lot going on out here. There's horns honking outside the studio. There's doors slamming. I'm not really sure what's going on, but I'll continue to, to rock and roll here. So Minnesota ends up beating the Buffalo Bills on the road. The Buffalo Bills spiraling a little bit out of control here. they got to get back to the basics. Um, you know, obviously a little bit, uh, a little bit disoriented right now, but I expect the bills to bounce back next week. So we'll be on them. We'll see what the spread is. The New York giants end up taking, taking care of the Texans at home. I expected this. I mean, the giants, they keep playing well. I mean, there's, you can't take anything away from them. I know. I think personally they're, you know, in the long run, they're a bit of a pretender, but you know, they take care of the Texans at, uh, at home and, and, uh, it's good to see for giants fans, certainly excited about the future there. Brian Dable's done such a great job. So the giants take care of the Texans at home. Kansas City dusts Jacksonville. No real surprise here by 10. Um, Trevor Lawrence continues to make strides. He made some nice throws. Christian Kirk, two touchdowns, but not enough to take down the Kansas City Chiefs, especially on the road. The Chiefs look great. They continue to roll. Matty Ice back at the helm. And, and something that made massive news this week in the sports world was obviously Frank Reich was fired in Indianapolis. And Jeff Saturday, former old lineman for Peyton Manning for a long time, an analyst for ESPN, took over. A very odd hiring. I know Rex Ryan was vocal on Sunday about that being a very questionable hiring, but Jeff Saturday, new voice in the room for the boys. And Matty Ice gets the start, looks okay, and they end up taking down the Raiders, and the Raiders are an absolute mess right now. What is going on with the Las Vegas Raiders? I mean, in the offseason, they made a lot of great trades. I mean, you bring in Chandler Jones to stand on the opposite side of the D-line with Max Crosby, and you bring in Devontae Adams from Green Bay, and you think that Josh Jacobs is going to take a stride, and you think Derek Carr is going to be fantastic, and you look like dog shit. And they have been awful. And that AFC West division that we thought was going to be so strong and so you know, fantastic with Russ coming in and with Justin Herbert making a stri- with strides and with the Raiders bringing in all. I mean, Kansas City is still those guys, and it is, you know, I know I mentioned that last podcast, but oh my gosh, the Raiders are such a mess. Aaron Rodgers, another call, making me look like a football genius, ends up coming back from down 28-14 to 14 and beating America's team in the Dallas Cowboys. Christian Watson, rookie receiver, finally found his stride, had three touchdowns. I mean, this Green Bay Packers team needed a win. They had lost five in a row coming to this game at Lambeau, and Green Bay ties it up. They go to overtime, and Aaron Rodgers, they get a big stop. Dallas, big stop on, on um, or they ended up not being able to convert the fourth down in overtime. Green Bay goes down and scores a field goal to win the game. Great to see from Aaron Rodgers. I, as much as I dislike in some of the things that Aaron Rodgers does, and I, and I always hate when people compare Tom Brady to Aaron Rodgers, but... I was happy for Aaron this week to get the win, feeling himself. I'm sure we'll hear the breakdown on Pat McAfee's podcast. <clears throat> Excuse me. The battle of the backups. Arizona travels to LA, and we were talking about teams spiraling out of control. Sean McVay has got to be just absolutely rattled with his team because the Rams lose to Colt McCoy and the Car- and the and the Arizona Cardinals. Colt McCoy looks like that guy. Is there a quarterback controversy right now in Arizona? I mean, Colt McCoy looked fantastic. They end up beating the Rams 27-17. I'm a Colt McCoy guy. I'm team Colt McCoy for the Arizona Cardinals right now. And on Sunday Night Football, the Chargers roll into San Francisco and can't get it done. They lose 22-16. Justin Herbert looked good at times, but just not enough to take down this talented San Francisco team. 
San Francisco is going to be a team that I'll be watching closely. I don't know if they're a team that can come out of the NFC, but they certainly will be a playoff team. I think they're going to be all, I think they're guaranteed to be the team that come out of the NFC West. Obviously Seattle off to a hot start. I don't think that's going to continue. Arizona looks like dog shit. And so do the Rams. So the 49ers look great. Christian McCaffrey there, all happy. Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk. I mean, their offense is just absolutely stacked. And I'm excited for the 49ers and the future of them. So Monday Night Football, we got Philadelphia, Washington. I'm on the upset. I'm going to go with Washington to cover the spread. I'm not sure what the spread is, but I'm going to be on Washington to cover the spread. I think the Eagles, I mean, historically speaking, they're going to drop a game here soon that we don't expect them to. I don't think they're going to have an undefeated season. I mean, do we think they're that good? I don't think so. So I, I'm going to be riding the uh, the Washington uh, Commanders this week. I think Tyler Heineke, Heineke is that guy for them. I think Terry McLaurin has a good game. And I think that they can continue to compete with this team. And I think they keep it close. So I'm going to be on the uh, Washington spread. So for all you listening today, you can check right now and see if I was wrong. But that's it for the NFL. Week 10 was exciting. But we're going to move into quarter two. And we're going to talk a little bit of the NBA. And my favorite storyline of the week, ladies and gentlemen, listening closely Bang Bros, an adult site online, is in the mix to buy the stadium rights to the Miami Heat. They have offered $10 million to name the Miami Heat's home the Bang Bros. Bang Bros Stadium. Now, I just I just have a hard time believing Adam Silver will allow this. It'll be one of those, uh, we just cannot allow that. But they're in the mix, it sounds like. Unbelievable that the Bang Bros, an adult site, is looking to buy the naming rights. I mean, I think it would be a power move. I, I don't mind the idea, but we'll see what happens in Miami. If you guys don't follow along on the Chalkboard app, which I do highly recommend you do, I'm on the Utah Jazz Fuck You Tour. Um, I was on TV last week, and I gave out a pick that the Atlanta Hawks would take down the Utah Jazz at home. They did not. So from this point forward, I decided that for the next 10 games, I would bet against the Utah Jazz. Fuck the Utah Jazz, and it's working. The, the Washington Wizards end up beating the Utah Jazz, and the Philadelphia 76ers end up beating the Utah Jazz. So I'm 2-0 and on the Fuck the Utah Jazz Tour, and I will be continuing on that Fuck You Utah Jazz Tour for the foreseeable future. So if you're not in the Chalkboard app and you are unaware that I am betting against all of the Utah Jazz games for the next eight, you should hop in there, and you should follow along. The Boston Celtics are off to an unbelievable start. No real surprises here. That young group of Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, and Marcus Smart are so gritty. They brought in Malcolm Brogdon. I mean, this team is deep, and they are fantastic. Love what they're doing in Boston. Embiid. Joel Embiid is on an absolute here. So I think it's going to be a Luka Doncic, Joel Embiid kind of toe-to-toe for the MVP this season. Maybe a little Giannis sprinkled in there. Um, but Joel Embiid... 42 points two nights ago, 59 points last night. The 76ers have turned it around. They are now, I think, fourth in the Eastern Conference. The 76ers team is deep, man. We talked about it last episode with Tyrese Maxey, James Harden, Tobias Harris, and, and Joel Embiid. I mean, this is going to be a team that's going to be, you know, a, a force come playoff time, and I'm really excited about it. I like Joel Embiid. I trusted the process with him. I think sometimes a little bit of a milk in the media, but... I'm, there was a there was a woman uh, I forget which was it Lana Rhodes or he called out I think a porn star at one point during his career and was like you know look like are you looking to mix it up and you just know that he's equipped with something that a porn star would just love to tangle with so I mean we'll see uh, we'll see if uh, Joel Embiid's trust in the process in that realm of his life but I know he's trusting the process in the basketball court forty two and fifty nine his last two games looks fantastic. LaMelo Ball returns for the Charlotte Hornets. That's a big piece to get back in the lineup. And you can say what you want about the Ball family. I really like LaMelo. I really like watching him. I think he's a fantastic player. I think he's the best of the three brothers. Fantastic player. I'm excited to watch this Hornets team uh, moving forward with LaMelo. I mean, this team is not a playoff team, but with LaMelo in the lineup, they're fun to watch. Um, It's interesting. I mean, what happened to LaVar Ball? I mean, this guy, LeVar Ball, was just an absolute staple in the media. I mean, this guy found media outlets to just go on these ridiculous rants. And, I mean, he was such a clown in the media. But I haven't seen much or heard much of him. So I wonder if his son sat him down and said, listen, man, we enough with the clown act, man. Enough's enough. So we'll, we'll see uh, We'll see what happens if, if LaMelo can make some noise in his return to Charlotte. But uh, I'm happy that LaVar is out of the media. But that might be something uh, I'd throw a bet on if I could get some odds. I bet you he makes some noise here soon. The Lakers finally get a win. They end a five-game losing streak. They beat Brooklyn. Um, but they're still such a mess. It's going to be interesting. I mean, I wonder if 
LeBron's going to stay there. I wonder if they're going to get one by Ama. I, I, I don't know what's going on with, with LA, but does it seem like LeBron just doesn't really care anymore in terms of, of team results? Does he Is he just waiting for his son? I feel as if it's just like he's just going to play, he's going to continue to rack up accolades and career stats, and then he's just going to wait for his son. He'll ride it out with a, a couple years with his son, which I don't I, I don't disagree with. I mean, he's, he's provided basketball fans with enough content and enough domination through his career for him to just be like, you know what? I'm okay with having a couple losing seasons. I'm okay to wait for my son, and that's how I'm going to ride out. I'm okay with that. So, anyway, moving on to the NHL in quarter three. No halftime show today. This is probably the story of the week in the NHL. The Boston Bruins end up signing defenseman Mitchell Miller, who, if you look at his stats, absolutely lit up the USHL last year. I think he had, like, 50 goals as a defenseman. But Mitchell Miller... I'm sure all of the listeners are familiar. When he was 14, he was... So there was a, a a black individual in his school that was mentally disabled. Uh, he suffered from alcohol. So his, his, his mom was drinking when he was, when he was uh, uh, you know, a fetus. So Mitchell Miller decided to put a lollipop in the urinal, in a urinal at school, and make him lick it, make him eat it, and called him the N-word. I mean, he was charged in, in juvenile court. I mean, these are very evil things to do. These, this is beyond bullying. This is th- These are criminal acts. I mean, this is just something that you, you scar a human being's life for. And especially to, you know, you, you have to think that this individual is harmless. It, it's just a disgusting story to hear what this Mitchell Miller was up to. Uh, he had an apology in court. Apparently he hasn't shown much remorse in terms of post court, but what Mitchell Miller has to do in my opinion, I'm going to go on about you know my opinion right now and you can take it for what it's worth. And I don't mean any disrespect to anyone or anyone involved. I don't know the totality of the situation, but Mitchell Miller needs to release a video. He needs to do something for the family. He needs to go face to face and show some sincerity and an apology, but you need to address the world. You need to address the world and telling, you know, how you've changed since your your fourteen year old self. What you've done to really show remorse, and and you just need to release that to the public. And I don't know if you're your his agent. Like, what what are you doing? You this is just a simple protocol. You need to apologize, and you need to show to people that you really are a different human being. And there's two sides of this story. I mean, obviously, we live in a world in today's age. Where if you do something negative and you do something wrong, it's you get canceled. I mean, there's the cancel culture. People have such a strong opinions, and if they think that it's disrespectful to the to the point where you're really hurting people, then you know you get canceled. But do I think it's fair for this Mitchell Miller kid to never be able to play in the NHL because of his acts of a 14 year old adolescent? I don't know if I do. You know, I I think that he can go through some steps. One, showing some real remorse and showing to the public and to the individual personally that he is extremely sorry and that's not a good reflection of his character in today's day and age as his 19-year-old self. But I, I don't think that it is fair to, you know, I'm a big believer in second chances. And I listen to Biz Nasty on Spit and Chick, let's talk about it. I mean, people get, people murder people and get second chances. I mean, I do think that people deserve second chances in life. And I don't think that these types of scenarios are a reflection of your character for your entire life. I mean, think about just you personally and how much you've changed in different regards of your life and personally, and as you mature, you know, how much, you know, you, you reflect on, on how, you know, immature some of maybe your ideologies were or, or how you acted. And I mean, I think of myself and I, it's just, it's, it's just, it's almost a 180. It's just a complete different, you know, mindset and, uh, and character. So it's unfortunate. I mean, you have to think the Boston Bruins, it was a terrible decision. I mean, you get off to the best start in franchise history and you decide to go out and sign this guy, but in their defense, um, it has come out that there was a lot of teams, uh, interested in signing Mitchell Miller. So the Bruins weren't the only ones. Um, but Gary Bettman, I, I don't know if I if I trust Gary Bettman. I mean, Gary Bettman came out and said, uh, obviously, that he wasn't able to play in the NHL, but I'm not sure if that was the case. I mean, do you think that the Bruins' contract and signing would have went through if that was the case? I'm not so certain, but obviously made tons of headlines. It's going to be interesting to see. I hope this Mitchell Miller guy 
comes out and makes a public video and really shows some remorse and walks us through the last five years of his life, you know, talking about how much this situation has impacted it and how he's, you know, willing to change and willing to show that he's not a bad guy or, or this is, or, you know, it, it's, there's just so many things you can do. And, and, uh, if you have a head on your shoulder, if you have any sort of a brain, you have to hop on this soon, or you're never really going to get the opportunity to play, to play professional hockey. Okay. I'm going to mess up this name, but I was in full on tears watching hockey night in Canada this week. Bjorn, Borgi Salming, Bjorn Salming. Anyway, the best defenseman in Toronto Maple Leafs history, the first Swedish player to ever come over in the NHL. And he played in just the rough and tough days of the NHL. And I mean, just a pioneer for European players in the NHL. Bjorn Salming is, he has the most assists in the Toronto Maple Leafs history. He now has ALS. So it was Hall of Fame weekend this weekend in the NHL. And obviously Roberto Luongo's in the Hall of Fame now. Daniel Alfredson, the City Brothers. Some iconic players. But... Bjorn Salman came over from Sweden, and uh, Daryl Sittler was there, Wendell Clark. I mean, it was really, uh, Lanny McDonald, it was really a special celebration in Toronto this week for the Hall of Fame uh, inductees. But Bjorn Salman, Hockey Hall of Famer, is, his jersey's retired in Toronto. And, I mean, to show the, to learn about the love of Bjorn Salman from the Toronto Maple Leafs fans, from hockey fans just across North America, I talked to my dad a little bit about the impact he had and how great he was as a player, but he now has ALS. He's unable to speak. It was very emotional for me to watch. Um, I won't lie. I, I was in tears. I mean, you know, watching Daryl Sittler cry and watching just, you know, how emotional it was for people to to really, you know, watch this human being who's, who's you know, on, his, on the back nine of his life and, and the impact that he had for the Toronto Maple Leafs organization and just hockey in general, especially for European players. It was really a special ceremony. So so credit to the Toronto Maple Leafs who put that on. And, and you know, I hadn't I didn't know much about uh, Salming, but, man, that was a special celebration. So I know a lot of the listeners are American, but it was a truly special uh, celebration. So, so go and Google that and watch that and, and, and tell me what you think. The New Jersey Devils are an absolute fire wagon, ladies and gentlemen. They're 12 and 3. Their statistics are off the charts. And it's due to the fact that, you know, Jesper Brad or Jasper Brad. I mean, Nico Heischer looks better. Uh, Jack Hughes is taking a big step. I mean, this team is phenomenal and they're getting some saves. I mean, Mackenzie Blackwood's injured right now, but Vanacek's been fantastic. I forget the backup uh, that came in um, the other night th- to beat Ottawa, but they're off to a 12 and 3 start. And I don't think that this is a team that's off to, th- I don't think they're pretenders, I'll put it. Um, they look fantastic. I'm really excited for for New Jersey, and it, it, they off. They I think they lost the first few games out of the out of the get go, and they wanted the, the fans were ch- chanting "Fire Lindy," Lindy Ruff being their coach, and uh, they were chanting last night or two nights ago. Sorry, Lindy. So Lindy Ruff seems like he's uh, all good in, in in New Jersey Devils land, but they look fantastic, and and I'm really excited about that team. They're fun to watch. They play with a lot of pace. Um, like I said, their their metrics are the best in the league in terms of expected goals per 60 minutes versus expected goals against per 60 minutes. So the New Jersey Devils off to a great start. And I don't see them slowing down. I mean, they'll probably end up in a race in the Metropolitan, but they look fantastic off the get-go. I thought I'd note that on the podcast. Seattle Kraken are off to a great start as well. They're 8-5-3. and three. But mark my words, this team is a pretending team. Obviously, Matty Beneers, rookie, is off to a great start. A lot of their, you know, they've, they've, they've looked great. But I don't think this team is going to be competing in the Pacific Division. And I think that it is worth noting that we're only, you know, 15, 16 games into the season. So, you know, a lot of these starts, there's still a ton of season left. Almost 70 games left in the NHL season. So, a lot of these starts, I mean, people are in panic mode. I think about Vancouver and I think about St. Louis. It's not type. It's not time to panic yet. Um, but Seattle, I think, will come back to life. Uh, but they do have a good young team, and uh, they're a fun team to watch. Uh, obviously, a great building. I think Seattle is such a great sports market. The St. Louis Blues were off to a 3-8 and eight start, and things were getting ugly. Craig Berube, obviously very emotional. Um, a great coach. Just, you know, gets high praise around the hockey world. Um, and Doug Armstrong, their GM, obviously the same boat. Ryan O'Reilly. See, this when I look at the St. Louis Blues, they signed Robert Thomas and Jordan Cairo to massive deals. They obviously had great years last year. Cairo hasn't even had an assist yet this season. That might have changed, but Ryan O'Reilly has looked old, and this decor is... 
they haven't been what they've been, and they, they don't have the goaltending. I mean, they let Huso go to Detroit, who's looked phenomenal, and they kept Bennington, who hasn't looked fantastic. So St. Louis has been struggling from you know their decor and, and, and goaltending side of things, um, and a lot of their forwards just haven't been producing. We look at Ryan O'Reilly and, 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 Ter- and Vladimir Tarasenko. They're on expiring deals. They're RFAs next year. Those two guys could be teams, uh, could be two guys that teams target uh, come trade deadline. Jack Campbell in Edmonton. Obviously, last year in Toronto, had a great start to his season, ended up being an all-star. This year has not looked fantastic. Five-year deal, and Stuart Skinner has been better, has been the better goaltender at Edmonton. And Jack Campbell, I mean, this guy, if you listen to him in his interviews, he's so emotional. He's so hard on himself. Um, So, obviously, he's working through some things. I think he does turn it around and start to play a bit better. But, you know, the Edmonton Oilers, who I think are going to be a heavy cup favorite, cup contender, need better goaltending from Jack Campbell. I think you give him a few starts off. I think you run Stuart Skinner, who's been fantastic, the young kid from Edmonton. Great story there. I think you give Jack Campbell a few nights off. And, uh, you know, I think you just, you got to do something different. I think, um, you know, if I'm a coach, maybe I'm a little old school, I let that guy go on a bit of a tear. Like, go out and get drunk with the boys, you know, mix it up a bit, have a few days off, and then come back and, you know, relieve some stress. Because, you know, obviously in the Canadian markets, the media is so hard on you. And it's uh, it's been a tough scene for Jack Campbell so far in uh, in Edmonton. Zach Rowenski, tough news for the Columbus Blue Jackets, will be done for the season. So that their best defenseman, uh, that's tough news for the Columbus Blue Jackets too. I don't think we're going to have a great season anyway, but Zach Rowenski, done for the year. All right, ladies and gentlemen, moving to quarter four. And if if you see me posting the chalkboard app, or if you see me post on Instagram, throw in a question for you, for me to answer on the podcast. I really do uh, appreciate you guys putting in some questions, and and I'll fight through them. You know, I'll uh, I'll sort through them. Obviously, some of them are, are clown ass questions, and and um, you know don't deserve the time of day on the podcast. But um, I'll start things off. Cody from Instagram: How far will the Vikings go this season? I might be the only guy on this planet that's not overly bullish on the Minnesota Vikings. Obviously, know how talented this team is, but I just don't know if Kirk Cousins is that guy. Um, I look at the NFC and it seems to be wide open. I think Tampa Bay is going to continue to get a bit uh, better. I think San Francisco is going to be right there. Um, is Minnesota that team? Not sold. I think Philadelphia obviously as well. Um, I, I, I think, well, clearly they're going to have home field advantage during the playoffs. They just continue to ream off wins. Um, I could see like an NFC championship game. I don't think Super Bowl, but you know, Kirk Cousins and they continue to surprise me. So they, I might eat my words, but I don't think uh, the Vikings are a Super Bowl team. Bobby Davis writes in, if you had a chance to play with any player in professional sports, what would, who would you play with? This is an easy answer for me. It's Tiger Woods. Um, I think that would be the most comfortable playing field that I would be able to step into uh, with a professional athlete. It would be Tiger Woods. Uh, play some golf with Tiger, pick his brain, and jerk him off. So I think that uh, playing with Tiger Woods would be fantastic. Um, so Bobby, yeah, it would be Tiger. Aaron McGinnis writes in, who's got the brightest future in the NHL? Great question here. Um, I, 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 this is a tough question. Obviously, it's it's tough to kind of look at teams and say, you know, this is this is going to be a team that's going to make a bunch of strides in the next few years. I'll, I'll say the Montreal Canadiens. Um, that new line of, of Nick Suzuki, Kirby Doc, and Cole Caulfield looks fantastic. Caden Gooley, Arbor Jacka. I mean, they've got a lot of great guys. Uh, young players who are, who are really learning the game fast. And I think that Montreal has a really bright future. I think Buffalo has a really f- bright future. I think Detroit has a lot of, you know, has a bright future. And, you know, these are teams obviously all in the Atlantic division. Um, so I think those are three teams that, uh, you know, uh, Buffalo, uh, Detroit, and uh, and I'll throw Ottawa in there as well. Obviously, Ottawa really missing uh, Josh Norris right now. Their defensive core is just banged up. They're missing Thomas Shabbat. They're missing their two top defensemen, Erdogan and Zub right now. Uh, it's really tough. Um, Arch says, what's up with the Utah Jazz? I went over earlier in the podcast, man. Fuck the Utah Jazz. Uh, are the Devils for real from Kevin? Uh, the Devils, I think they are for real. Yeah, I think their their, their metrics, their statistics, their statistics uh, show you know a lot of promise. Um, I really like what I've seen from the Utah Jazz. Or sorry, not from the Utah Jazz, from the New Jersey Devils. Um, so I do think they're for real. I do think this is a team that's going to come out of the Metropolitan Division and be a playoff team. So I'm excited for them and excited for that fan base. Jackson writes in, what should the Canucks do? Great question. Um, you know what? I think the Canucks should... I mean, there's not really much they can do. They're pressed up against the cap. They've signed a lot of their young players. Um, you know, 
I don't know. I don't know how you really blow it up. I mean, you signed JT Miller to a long-term deal. You signed Elias Pettersson to a long-term deal. You sign. I think you just, you got to keep the head to the grindstone. Like, I think this team is a bit better. I mean, I, it would be nice for them to bring in a defenseman. Obviously, they brought in Ethan Bear, but they need better goaltending. Thatcher Demko's been off to a really bad start. He needs to pick up his game. Um, and then I, I think it's just by committee. I mean, everyone needs to be better. Everyone needs to be more accountable. But this roster is talented. So um, I don't know if it's going to be a complete disaster for uh, for Vancouver, but I know um, it's going to be a uh, it's it's going to be interesting in Vancouver to see you know their media is loud their fan base is loud all right folks well that's the end of episode 19 season three I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the monologue I know it's not everybody's favorite but I am working on getting some fantastic guests guests in the near future I really do appreciate you guys listening make sure you leave a five-star review make sure you go follow on Instagram TikTok Twitter um, yeah listen and we'll be back on Friday everyone have a fantastic week and as always, let's fucking ride.